Uh, thank you, Gilly Tava. That was a lovely introduction, and it's so wonderful to be uh, in Sydney again and uh, at Moore Theological College. And I uh, thank you, Andrew, for I guess for our local host today. I uh, and my wife Melissa is here as well. And as we were walking towards Newtown, I, I knew the building didn't look like the way I remembered it. In fact, my memory was confirmed when the during lunch, Andrew informed me that indeed, uh, when I was here last time, 2011, uh, the older building was still here. So congratulations on this wonderful new facility. So. Uh, and again, thanks to everybody. Good to see friends, students, colleagues. And um, uh, I keep thanking Ian and the department, Ely, and other members of the department for hosting me on the academic side at the uni, and people at Mendelman House for hosting us uh, with our accommodation. So great. Uh, this new book has just been published, How the Bible is Written. Uh, I've been working on it for years. It is actually 650 pages. It was published by Hendrickson, a um, small specialty publisher in the US, which you hopefully know. And I thought I'd give you a precy and summary of it in 45 minutes, right? How does one do that? So for those of you who know my work, I've been working on these topics that are in the book. We're talking about topics such as wordplay, alliteration, repetition with variation, dialect representation, or style switching, all these terms that are used. And I decided to bring all those articles that I have written in the past together and try to create a sustained volume. It is not a volume of collected studies, however, where I just repeat chapter after chapter, like some scholars do, which is fine. But I wanted to create a sustained, continuous work on the various um, issues that I have spent my time, my years, um, uh, researching and publishing. So let's just begin. I don't think that we can go through 18 pages in the 45 minutes, so we'll have to skip some parts, but let's do the best we can, proceeding um, quickly but not overly fast. So you don't have to read long in the Bible before you encounter a, a linguistic conundrum. All you have to do is read the first two words. And students in particular will know this because you learn Hebrew 101. You know the, the book by Athos and Young, right? That's the one I'm talking about, okay? <laughs> and you learn about the construct phrase. And then you open up the Bible and you read the first two words and you have Bereshit bara, and all of a sudden this doesn't fit into the grammatical rules that you have learned. Because in a construct phrase, noun X must be followed by noun Y. But in this case, noun X or something like noun X is followed by a verb. So I like to think that this is almost intentional, that the uh, eventual compilers, not necessarily of the Bible, but that would be at a much later stage, but of the book of Genesis or the Torah as a whole, uh, set the tone for what would be a text that demands your attention to the linguistic details. And so Bereshit bara is a conundrum which we really cannot solve in any, in any way. I mean, we can translate it in the beginning of God created the heavens and the earth, and I've done that intentionally capture the, which is really not grammatical English, but I've attempted to capture the Hebrew uh, there as best as I can. So the great medieval commentator Rashi points out in his comments that there is a parallel to this in Hosea 1-2, Tehilat Diver Adonai Hosea, which I've rendered here the beginning of Yahweh spoke to Hosea, again, not very grammatical English, which is a lovely parallel and a very helpful parallel, but in the end doesn't really allow us to um, explain it, and we'll just leave it at that. Okay, uh, we've lost our projection. Um, right, do I have to keep, keep touching something? Okay. <laughs> I think there's no PowerPoint, it's just a handout projection, so you can. Yes, maybe. Laptop's coming back. <laughs> we don't. Yeah. 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 That's it. Is. Yeah. Laptop one. Yeah. Oh. Maybe it lost the. Okay, so now the screen is ready again.
Good. So the only question is, will it keep, keep alive? Uh, we'll, we'll see. Um, my uh, teacher, the late uh, Jonas Greenfield, used to say, the first rule of audiovisual is that something always goes wrong. Well, uh, he didn't live to see the great PowerPoints that we have today. And uh, fortunately, most of the time, it now works very well. Uh, but you still have the little pinks. OK. So you can enjoy the PowerPoint, the, the handout on the screen if you'd like as well. So there we start with a linguistic conundrum. Um, and we'll just leave it at that. Now, uh, as you know, uh, there are refrains that repeat throughout the creation account. I'm starting with Genesis 1, which is also the first chapter of the book. And these refrains are the usual, as you see there next. Uh, and um, uh, it was evening, it was morning. Well, the refrains actually go with, and God said, and then let something happen. And of course, it happens each day. Um, God saw that it was good. And then the refrain was morning. And it was evening. It was evening. It was morning, and you know, day, whatever it, it may be. So you see some of that here on um, uh, this, this part of the handout. Okay. Talking about our refrains, um, but there is an oddity here, and that is on day two, Genesis one eight, the refrain that God saw that it was good is lacking. Now this is supplied by some of the ancient versions, but I think the Masoretic text must stand as it is. Um, water, which is part of the pre-existent matter uh, at the very beginning of creation, is not created per se on day two, but the word mayim appears five times in day two, and you have the separation of the waters above and the waters below and all of that. And uh, because the cosmic mass of water, the abyss, was associated with evil in all of the ancient Near Eastern cosmologies, I think that this is an intentional omission of what otherwise would be a perfection of every day having the same refrains. So this is a text that is allowing you as a reader, or demanding that you as a reader pay attention to think about all the little things we're talking about. One of the topics in my, um, oh, let's stay with this, right. So uh, um, the next topic to talk about in Genesis 1, talking about the nexus of language and literature, which if I had to define the book in four words, it would be the nexus between language and literature, that's five words maybe. And uh, let's talk about the lack of the word sun and moon in Genesis chapter 1, verses 14 through 19, day 4 uh, of creation. And we all know these long circumlocutions, the greater light to govern the day and the lesser light to govern the night, and so on. This, I think, is intentional as well because Shemesh and Yareach are the names of Canaanite deities and more widely ancient Near Eastern deities. And the author wants you to, um, th doesn't want to use those terms lest the innocent reader somehow think that uh, the single God is responsible for the creation of pagan deities. Hence, no Shemesh and no uh, Yareach. This also explains Genesis 1.10, I think, where you don't have the word Yam, because that would be the name of the Canaanite sea god, well attested in Ugaritic mythology, but instead the plural yamim, ulamikveh hamayim kara yamim, and the gathering of waters he called seas, right? All the other things that get mentioned and are named are these sort of single nouns, right? Eretz and Shemayim and, and um, um, Archia, there you have these words in the singular. Here you have, uh, oddly, a term in the plural yamim, but I think that's, again, intentional. You have to think about these things as you work your way through um, as you work your way through uh, the text. Let's see, I can't get it all on the screen at once. Bottom of page one, as you see, are the names of the days of the week. And um, these also are um, all, uh, as you can see here, numbers. This is all sort of the same process. The names of the days of the week, both in our calendar, in English, Sunday, Monday, etc., uh, although you have to know some Norse there to get into Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Uh, these are named for polytheistic deities. And this was true of the ancient Babylonian calendar as well. And so you have all of these terms in Genesis 1. Uh, this is to be seen as a type of demythologizing. I like to tell my students, as those who have also been exposed to New Testament, history of New Testament scholarship, that uh, demythologizing didn't start with Bultmann but rather it started already in Genesis chapter 1, where you have this effort to uh, omit the names of pagan uh, deities, and therefore all the names of the days of the week in Hebrew 
are very bland and almost colorless, day one, second day, third day, fourth day, uh, etc. The exception, of course, is uh, in Hebrew, you do have a name for the seventh day of the week, uh, Shabbat, but um, uh, in the creation account, that name is also omitted, and Shabbat is the word for Saturn in Hebrew, Shabbat or Shabbatai is the word for the planet Saturn, hence in English we still say Saturday, right, which actually is Saturn's day. So uh, even there, the author of Genesis 1, or in the case of day 7, segueing into Genesis 2, doesn't want to use the term Shabbat, and therefore uses the expression uh, Yom Shvi'i or Yom HaShvi'i. Okay, now why is my... The, 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 the projection here isn't quite the same as what should be on the handout. I'm not sure why that is. Okay. So, uh, those are some thoughts about the very beginning of Genesis and some of the things to pay attention to as you read through the text. Now, Genesis 1, verse 11. Right here. Uh, and verses 12. Uh, there is a well-known phenomenon in Ugaritic texts and elsewhere in the Near East, and certainly in the Bible, which we can call the command and fulfillment pattern. And that is to say, uh, a command is given and then it is fulfilled. In this case, a divine command and then it is fulfilled. Uh, the norm in biblical Hebrew writing is non-verbatim repetition. I call this uh, a repetition with variation. So if you look and compare verses 11 and 12, which you have now on the board for you, in verse 11, God says, Tache ha'aretz desha, Esav mazri azera, Eitz peri, Osev peri lamino, Asher zar ovo, al ha'aretz barigichen. And it was so, in the English translation there also to follow along. An, un unusual, an unusual verb, Tache, denominative from the common noun desha. But in verse 12, the text goes to great lengths to vary the language in the fulfillment. Here you have a more common verb, so when it actually, when the action happens, vatotse ha'aretz, and the earth brought forth vegetation. Notice the expressions that are varied between lines 11 and 12. So you have the asev mazriya zera, both in 11 and 12, but in 12 you then get liminehu. In 11 you only had limino further on, and in verse 12 you're actually going to get two liminehus. So you have them in different positions, and where in verse 11 there's only one expression of according to its kind, in verse 12 there are two expressions of according to its kind. In verse 11, eight peri ose peri, uh, fruit trees that produce fruit. Notice what happens in verse 12, simply eight ose peri, right, trees that produce fruit, omitting one of the uses there of the word peri, uh, fruit. Asher zar ovo, in verse 11, appears where it appears after Lemino, but in verse 12, Asher Zar Ovo appears before Lemino. Now, did you all follow that? Now, may I remind you that if you are following all these very minor changes, that we are able to do this through our eyes because we have in front of us the written text, and we are, of course, trained to read visually. But may I remind you that in antiquity, reading was an oral uh, enterprise. There was no such thing as silent reading. One person would have held the text, perhaps in a gathering such as this with 20, 30 people, and the text would have been intoned or presented or performed in a way, and everybody else would have listened. So you have what I call the oral, oral effect of presenting a text, oral from the mouth, oral into the ear, hard words to differentiate in any dialect of English, I think. And uh, that's the way reading took place in ancient Israel. Robert Alter uh, conjures up the image of the shepherds around the campfire at night uh, when uh, one person was reading the text and telling the story and everybody else listened. Lovely pastoral setting. Uh, in a more urban environment, I sometimes like to think of the uh, people outside or inside the city gate where you have a, a, a town square or a piazza or a plaza of some sort where there might have happened in a, in a case like that. So people had to listen to these differences and they uh, the memories were such because that's the way they read and that's the way they uh, consumed the text orally, orally, was therefore they were able to, to work through all of these little differences. Now, um, if you look at the next example, verse 29, so this comes uh, 
quite later in the story, this is at a distance of 17, 17 18 verses. This is on day six where God gives uh, humanity the permission to eat, or the, the food to eat, uh, the food to eat. And here all of a sudden you have, you can work this out on your own, all these other expressions which are evoking what you saw in 11 and 12, but using different uh, equivalences and expressions. The most obvious of them here on the bottom of the screen is that in 11 and 12, on um, day three, it's Mazria Zera in the Hifiel, and on day six, it's Zorea Zera using the Kal form. As far as I can tell, there's no distinction in meaning here, and I've translated these hyper-literally to seed, seed in both cases, but you get a sense of how you're supposed to keep all of this in your mind, that when you got to verse 29, you realize this is yet another uh, repetition with variation. Top of the next page, Right, top of the next page, uh, similarly in verse 24, uh, the animals in day six are first called chaito eretz, an archaic form, and that may raise an eyebrow for the person listening to the story, but in the next verse, you now get the more familiar chayat ha'aretz, standard Hebrew grammar, standard Hebrew phraseology, and it may bring a smile to the listener who will now understand what chaito eretz uh, meant, vary the language in every single case. Talking about variety, let's focus on the chiasm in Genesis 12, verse 3. A simple four word, two words to each stick uh, poetic couplet. And let me bless those who bless you, and he who curses you I will damn. Notice all of the differences in these words right here. In the A line, you have the same root, bless and bless, bet, resh, kaf. In the B line, the poet takes advantage of the fact there are two Hebrew uh, verbs for uh, curse. Kof, lamed, lamed, followed by aleph, resh, resh, which I translate separately as curse and damn. In the A line, the I will bless appears before those who bless you. And in the B line, the I will curse follows the those who curse you. In the A line, those who bless you is in the plural, and in the B line, now I correct what I just said, it's actually in the singular, he who curses you. And furthermore, in the, in the B line, you have the standard yiktol form, but in the A line, you notice you have the longer cohortic form. So it would be very bland and very rote to just do A, B, and then the equivalents A prime, B prime. Our poet has done a remarkable amount of juggling here to evoke the language that you see here. Now, I don't have to teach anybody in the room about biblical parallelism where you have the A and the B lines. We just saw an example of it, and using the, the formula of both Robert Alter and James Kugel, the A, what's more, B effect. But at times in the Bible, we have um, uh, three cola in a line of poetry. And the A lines and C lines don't match up, and therefore in the B line you have what's called the Janus effect, or the Janus parallelism. Here's a perfect example in Genesis 15. I'm giving you passages from familiar, uh, examples from familiar passages in this case. So far we haven't left the book of Genesis. Um, and um, notice in the A line, Altira Abram, do not fear uh, Abram. In the C line, Scharcha Harbe Ma'od, your reward shall be very great. In the B line you have this word Magain. Now, magain means shield, basic meaning of the Hebrew noun, and that, of course, connects up with the A line. Do not fear, Abraham, because I'm your shield, says God. But that leaves the C line dangling by itself. But if you know the depths of the Hebrew lexicon, then you also know that the verbal root, mem gimel nun, means to grant or to be a benefactor of, basically a fancy word for give in the PLB game. And that length, that latches, that connects to the C line. So you have two meanings to the word my game. In the basic meaning, shield, it looks back to the A line. And with the rarer meaning to grant or bestow, it looks ahead to the uh, C line. And uh, therefore, you have what's called the Janus effect, named for the two headed, two faced Roman god who looked in both directions. And our month named January is named for Janus as you look back to the old year and ahead to the new year. How could you expect that a reader of Genesis 15 might actually know this verb? Well, fortunately, our author, cleverly I should say, 
placed it a few verses earlier in Genesis 14, verse 20, uh, Asher mi gain saretha biadecha, who has granted your enemies or delivered your enemies, something like that, uh, into your hand, where you see the PL verb be uh, gained. So it's fresh in your mind when you get to 15, 1. The first Janus parallelism ever to be found is in Song of Songs 2, 11, where again you have in the A line the key noun is blossoms, in the C line the key noun phrase is the voice of the turtle dove, kol hator, and in the B line you see the word zamir, which means both singing and pruning. And with the meaning pruning looks back to blossoms, and with the meaning singing looks ahead to uh, the voice of the turtle dove. This was discovered by my main teacher, Cyrus Gordon. I was present in the room, graduate seminar, 1977, on the Song of Songs, and we got to this verse, and everybody started debating all the commentaries. Marvin Pope says this, Robert Gordon says this, which one could have possibly mean? This translation says pruning, this one translation says singing, and then Gordon said it means both on the spot. He realized because you've got the parallel structure here with an ABC structure. Uh, it was like being in the lab when Watson and Crick discovered the molecular structure of the DNA molecule, uh, except I think that the, um, I was hoping to get a little laugh from that. <laughs> uh, uh, but to be present at the moment of discovery, um, Cambridge 1954 versus New York 1977, sciences versus humanities. Okay, so uh, staying with our, with where we are, Genesis 15, I want to call your attention to this device, which, not is, which is not uh, recognized by, um, not widely recognized. Um, God has made numerous promises to Abraham to, um, uh, about offspring and so on, you know the text. And uh, he makes another one in Genesis 15, 1. And for the first time, Abraham speaks back. And Abraham speaks up, I should say. And he says in verse 2 there, right, uh, Lord Yahweh, what will you give me? And I go childless. And now I borrow the translation, the felicitous translation of Everett Fox, and the son domestic of my house is domestic Eliezer, because I want to capture the alliteration of Ben Meshek and Damesek. Ben Meshek is a hapax legomenon in the Bible, and why did the text use it and what might it mean? And Everett Fox very cleverly chose the word domestic to translate it uh, to uh, echo the following word, uh, Damesek, Damascus. So, uh, that's not the main point I wanted to make, but just to point out the alliteration that's right there, and remember you're here in the text, right? Uh, so Abraham says something to God in verse 2, uh, close quote at the end of verse 2, and then you expect what? God to speak. God doesn't speak. And so in verse 3 you have once again, by Yomer Avram, and you see what, uh, what Abraham does, says there in verse 3. The effect of this is as follows. There are speeches in the Bible which go two, three, four verses. Sometimes real long speeches. But usually two, three, four verses, you can get speeches like that. In which case there's only one biomer X, and the person or God speaks, and then you have a few verses, and you have the equivalent of close quote, and you move on. In this case, Abraham's speech is divided up with two biomer Avram, beginning of verse two and beginning of verse three. The effect is that at the end of verse 2, there is a pregnant pause. Abraham is expecting God to say something, and he doesn't. And therefore, you need another by Yomer Avram. And Abraham continues on with some more speech. And then he is eventually, shock may be too strong a word, but notice how verse 4 begins with the vehine, right? And behold, because all of a sudden God does speak to him in verse 4. So I don't have a good name for this device, perhaps to call it the, and he said, um, uh, dot, 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 and he said, dot, dot, dot device, but we have to come up with a better name than that. But I just wanted to call this one um, to, your, uh, to your attention here. Um, okay, let's continue with this. Genesis 15, verse 16. Um, Somewhat oddly, God says towards the end of that chapter, and the fourth generation shall return hither, for the iniquity of the Amorite will not be complete until then. The Amorite? Why the Amorite? What are they doing in the text? Maybe Canaanite would be good, or I don't know, some other term. 
And yes, I know the word Amorites and Canaanites sometimes overlap and intersect in the Bible, uh, but nevertheless, it's still somewhat of an oddity. Fortunately, just a few verses later, or happily just a few verses later, what do we read in Genesis 15, the very last verses of the chapter? You have a list of the ten nations in the land of Israel, the land of Canaan. This is the only place in the Bible where you get a list of ten nations. Usually it's a list of seven nations, sometimes it's a list of six nations. Uh, here you get a list of ten nations. And notice that the Amorite, the Eta Emori, is in seventh position. This is the 710 convention. The, in a list of 10, item number 10 will always be important, and item number 7 will be important. So the text has specifically placed Ha'emori in position number 7, and that explains why a few verses earlier you had this somewhat odd expression about the iniquity of the Amorite. And the Jebusite, Et Ha'ibusi, culminates the list in number 10 position because, of course, that focuses our attention on Jerusalem. Other examples of the 710 uh, convention in Genesis 5, I don't think it's a coincidence that Enoch is in position number 7, and you all know how odd his little narrative is, right? He walked with God. In post-biblical Judaism, obviously, that would become a major uh, motif. And obviously, Noah in position number 10. Have you ever pondered why the genealogy at the end of the book of Ruth begins with Peretz? Maybe with Jacob. Uh, maybe with Judah. Maybe go back to Abraham. Something. But Peretz is an awfully odd figure to begin the genealogy with. But when you begin with Peretz, what happens? You get Boaz in position number 7, and David in position number 10. That's the 710 convention. And very bottom of that page, focus our attention also on the seventh plague, which is the longest divine speech in the plague's account, and all sorts of other interesting items there in uh, plague number seven. Obviously, plague number ten will be the culmination. The first person to uh, point this out, it's always good to give credit where credit is due, was Jack Sasson, who was the first one to note the 710 convention, and then Scott Nagel gets credit for noticing the importance of the seventh plague in the book of Exodus narrative. Okay. Um, well, let's, um, let's, I, I won't be able to do it all obviously today, so let's skip uh, the next page and I'm going to have to skip a bunch of pages because I want to focus on some of the more, uh, interesting little things that I wanted to present today. And some of these are well known and maybe little teasers. Okay, let's, um, let's go to page 10. And if there's anything on the bottom of page 10, if there's anything on the intervening um, material that you want to hear about, I can discuss that. Actually, as long as we're on page 10, let's do one thing in Genesis 29. Verse 20, one of my favorite verses in the Bible. You all have favorite verses, you're all supposed to have a few favorite verses. Okay? <laughs> Hopefully they're not buried in the book of Job. Hopefully there's some place where you can recognize them. Okay? That's a good question. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, 29, 20. So you know the story. Jacob comes to uh, Haran, and watches the action at the well, and he meets Rachel, and they agree, he meets his father-in-law, his uncle, and soon-to-be father-in-law. Laban, and they agree that they will, he will, then you get to verse 20. Ve'ya'avod Ya'akov Berachel Sheva Shanim Ve'yu Ve'enav Ki Yamim Achadim Ve'ahavato Otah. Jacob worked for Rachel seven years, and they were in his eyes as a few days, such was his love for her. And what happens in the next verse, 21, which I don't have here? We're ready for the wedding feast. Didn't anything happen in those seven years that was of interest to narrate? The first 19 verses of the chapter was one month of action. In fact, most of that was one day of action. All of a sudden, seven years go by just like that in one verse. This is an example of form follows content. You, the reader, are supposed to understand how those seven years went by in Jacob's view, 
because you get it narrated to you only in a single verse. Such was his love for her that the seven years passed as a bit as if they were but a few days. In fact, translating that to text, a single verse. Now, when's the last time you heard the expression? When's the last time you heard the expression Yamim Ahadim, few days? Go back a few chapters to chapter 27, verses 43 and 44, where Rebekah tells her son Jacob to go flee to Haran to live with your uncle Laban. Verse 44, Yashafta imo yamim ahadim, and you shall sit with him a few days until the anger of your brother Esau subsides. Those few days became what? Seven years, and another seven years, and then actually another six years. And it was 20 years before he returned home. So that's the last time you heard that expression. You're supposed to make the connection between the two. And don't follow the documentary hypothesis, by the way, which takes these two phrases and these two verses and puts them into different sources. This is clearly a unified text, where the Yami Mahadim of Genesis 29, you're supposed to hear the Yami Mahadim, which you heard in Genesis 27. That's an editorial comment. <laughs> So I like to refer to the two building blocks of biblical literature as the repetition with variation with which we started looking at a few examples in Genesis 1, and alliteration, of which we've already seen uh, one before. Alliteration is underappreciated in the Bible, I think, but there are numerous examples of it if you just know where to look for them, or rather better, where to hear them. Very frequently, and when you come across a rare word including a hapax legomenon, or a word that may only appear a few times, or if you're in a prose text and you see a word that is actually a, better known from poetry, pay attention to the sounds of the words around it. Most likely it is alliterated. Here's a few examples of hapax legomenon. In Jeremiah 2.2, oh, I didn't include the translations here, kilulo tayech, a hapax, a word that means something to do with a wedding, your wedding, your nuptials, your something, your marriage. Uh, the Hebrew word kala, bride, of course, is related to this, common noun. Why does Jeremiah 2.2 employ the word kalulo tayach? Look at the next word, lechtech, right? You're getting the same sound as the prophet poet has evoked the oral uh, sound effect there. 1 Samuel 19, verse 20, lahakat, the only time this word appears in the Bible, Lahakat Hanevi'im, a group of prophets. And what do you have? The very verse, a few words earlier, Lahakat, evoking the sounds of Lahakat, and also helping with the alliteration, Malachim, um, uh, earlier in the verse, Malache, uh, later in the verse, all evoking uh, the same sound. Top of the next page. Top of the next page, one of my, again, favorite examples. Judges 14, verse 18. Um, Samson, the people of the uh, city, uh, the Philistines, solved his riddle. And um, the text says in uh, verse 18 there, Bayom uh, HaShivii, on the seventh day, Beterem yavo ha Just before the sun had set, they told him, Mama Tok, etc., right? What is sweeter than honey, and so on. Samson's response is, latter part of the verse, Vayomer lahem lule harashtem be'eglati lo mitzatem chidati. And he said to them, If you had not plowed with my heifer, you would not have found out my river. The word charsa, an atypical form of an atypical word, cheres, meaning sun, is employed earlier in the verse. The writer of Judges 14 could have employed the word shemesh, which would have made for a delightful play on the name Shimshon, our hero, Samson. But he passed on that, reached deep into the Hebrew lexicon, plucked the word cheres because charsa, anticipates the sounds of harashtem. Just wonderful, okay? The way the Hebrew language works and the way the Hebrew authors 
were able to utilize their words. And of course, Kharashtem Be'eglati has a sexual innuendo there, right? If you had not plowed with my heifer, you would not have found out my riddle. Genesis 21. Here's an example of a poetic word in verse 7, mileo. The word, it's a word verb of speech, utter or something like that. We know it only from Psalms and Job, the only place where the verb mileo appears. But in verse 7, Sarah says, Mi mileo la Abraham. Who would have said to Abraham, that she would nurse, Sarah would nurse children and so on, she would give birth to a son. Why Mileo? Because it evokes the sounds of other verbal roots that have the mem lamed combination in them. Vayamol at the beginning of verse 4, he circumcised, and Vayigamal and Higamel in verse 8, he was uh, weaned in verse 8. So you hear the mem lamed combinations throughout this story. And therefore, we're going to take a word that we know from poetry, which has a richer lexis, and employ it here in the prose in, uh, uh, in verse 7, the only time that verb appears in all of um, Hebrew prose narrative. Okay, uh, form follows content. I'll do some of these just very quickly. I know we're um, uh, limited. We're going to five minutes, right? Okay. Uh, I knew I would get through this whole thing, but I prepared lots of material in an, in an in an effort maybe to do as much as I could. Um, 39 verses one through six, form follows content. The blessings that come on Potiphar's house are, are, are because of Joseph's presence, are just told in the most flowery of languages. Read through verses one through six. One verse would have been sufficient, right? And the Lord blessed Potiphar's house because of Joseph's presence. But no, it goes through uh, over and over again with repeated language. Uh, bottom of page 12. Confused language in the Bible. But there are places in the Bible, I published a, a separate article on this in the Journal of Hebrew Scriptures and now a revised version of it inside the book, one of the chapters. Uh, there are places in the Bible where the language is intentionally confused. In uh, verse 4 of the uh, story of Rahab, Vatikah ha'isha et shnei ha'anashim And the woman took the two men and she hid him. Right? That's what the Hebrew says. Most English translations fudge this and just say, and she took them. Right? They either amend the text, and they think batitzbeno should be batitzbenaim, or something, and they say, and she hid them. But the text is clear, and she hid him. Why? Because there's a knock on the door, or uh, whatever the equivalent of that was in, in, in Rahab's house, and the king's men are there, and they say to her in verse 3, bring out the men who came to you, and in a single instant, Superwoman Rahab, in a matter of um, in a matter of uh, multitasking, no 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 man could do this. Only a woman would be able to do this. We would chase off the men of the king could send, and also hide the two men who were in her house. Gets them to hide. Uh, she hides them. But of course, in the excitement of the moment, in the speed of action of what's happening here, she can't possibly hide the two men and speak to the people at her door. So she hid one, it says, and she hid one. Other translations, by the way, make an even bigger leap and put it in the blue perfect. And the woman had hid the two men. That's not what the Hebrew says. And we know how to express the blue perfect in Hebrew, and you see it in verse 6. And she had taken them up to the roof. This is the simple narrative preterite, and she hid him. So I'm giving you a sense of how the language is confused here because of the confusion of the moment. But there's more to it than that. If you know your Hebrew grammar really well, you'll know that batitzpano is the wrong form. How do you say, and she hid him, in good biblical Hebrew? Bottom of that page, batitzpanehu. And you heard that back in Exodus chapter 2, verse 2, when Moses' mother hid him. That's the proper pronominal suffix for, and she hid him him, but it's Benehu. So you not only have, with Rahab, and she took the two men and she hid him, which is already confusing enough, but she also have the wrong pronoun suffix on the Wayuktol verb, as if the English equivalent would be something like, and she hid his, right? Because you know that the O there is the suffix that you attach to prepositions and to, and to nouns. So these are the difficulties of the text, but you're not supposed to amend them. You're supposed to deal with them, 
You're supposed to understand the literary artistry. And by using a word that means, and she hit him, even if it's not in the same form, the text at the same time brings you back to Exodus because, as you, many of you know, there are numerous parallels between the opening chapters of the book of Joshua and the Moses story. You are supposed to see all of the parallels. Hence, the book of Joshua has a manna story, a Passover story. An angel appears to Joshua and tells him, you're standing on holy ground, remove your shoes. Uh, there is the splitting of the Jordan to parallel the splitting of the Reed Sea. All the things that happen in the Moses account in the book of Exodus are paralleled with the same themes and motifs in the beginning of the Joshua story. And so your mind is actually brought back through this single word here, but it's Spano, to the last time a woman hid a single male uh, human being. Those are the complexities of the Bible. I was hoping to get to a little bit more of this done today, but we'll stop right here, as we say in Hebrew, Adkan, until now. And uh, there's always more time for discussion now and on other occasions, hopefully. Thank you. Okay, so uh, thank you very much, Larry. We'll take a few questions. We have 10 minutes for that. Yeah, thank you very much, Gary, for a very interesting paper. Um, I'd like to first take you back to page four, if I could, and it's Genesis 15, verses 2 to 4. Simply to note that I appreciated your, uh, your wordplay when you referred to a pregnant pause uh, with Abraham waiting for a... Uh, I will have to pick up on that. <laughs> <laughs> um, also to say, I, I wonder whether um, you're saying you're kind of struggling to find a, a term to capture what's going on with the volume air, dot, 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 volume air construction, and I wonder whether maybe hiatus captures the sense of that. A uh, hiatus would be a good term. Uh, Gilly may be able to help me with it. I think it was Shmar Yaku Talmud who published on this. And, uh, by all right, yeah. Uh, was it? I know someone else. Mayor Weiss, who was it? That, um, yeah, I, it's sort of part of the oral Torah at the Bible Department of Hebrew University. Right. Yeah, uh, but I don't remember exactly. I think Tom Cynthia Miller. Some, but I, pardon? Cynthia Miller. Cynthia Miller has also done that? Yeah, okay, good. Her book on representation of speech, right? Uh, oh, I forget how the name of the, the title of the book. So, thank you. Um, yeah, hiatus isn't a bad term for that, right? Yeah, that's, that's, I, like, I like that. I did also have a, a question for Unless you. they're discussing offspring, which case pregnant pause starts. <laughs> <I really don't laughs> um, can I just ask you about the title of your paper, though? I, I noticed that you've got uh, how the Bible is written rather than how the Bible was written. I was right. wondering, is there something to find behind that? So I thought long and hard about this. Actually, that's not true. I didn't think long and hard about <laughs> this. I just said the title of the book is going to be How the Bible is Written. And um, some people have asked me about that as opposed to how the Bible was written. And I thought that if I entitled it How the Bible Was Written, it may take us more to ink and papyrus and eventually parchment and things like that. And so I wanted to keep it in the present tense. And I decided How the Bible Is Written, the name of the book and the name of today's uh, talk, uh, because to me the Bible is a living text and I kept it in the present tense. In fact, when I posted the appearance of the book on Facebook, um, Nothing happens in the world unless it's on Facebook, you guys, right? So when I posted it on Facebook after its appearance two weeks ago, um, one of my um, colleagues actually added a comment. I like the present tense in the title. So he picked up on that. Right? Uh, so hopefully that explains why I decided to put how the Bible is written. It is a living text. Uh, it's both a text from ancient Israel that we have to transport ourselves back 3,000 years, but it remains a living text as well. Thank you. So Gary, you've got all these um, examples of really rare words, you know, like your Hasa word for the sun, Milel for speaking is really, really rare, uh, and so on like that. And they're brought and they're brought into the text for literary reasons, is what you're saying there. What do you think that tells us about the way that normal biblical Hebrew represents the ancient Hebrew lexicon? I know do you understand my question? Uh, yes. Right. So. The, the prose narratives clearly represent, to my mind, represent the basic way that the people of ancient Israel spoke. And not that we have a lot, but if you look at all the ancient Hebrew inscriptions we have, and we have lots of numbers, but they're not long, the amount of material is a small textbook. Um, 
What do we have? One word that we didn't know from the Bible? Zidah in the Hezekiah tunnel inscription, maybe? Yeah. Uh, well, there's quite, a, there's, there's quite a few words we didn't know from the yeah. Bible. But that's the most famous one, I think. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. There aren't many of these words that we really didn't know. So it seems to be that these are the words that people used in their everyday speech and when they wrote a letter to somebody, like we have in Arad or Lachish, uh, and so on. Uh, poetry, of course, is a much deeper lexicon. And in the one example we have, some what looks like poetic material from an ancient Hebrew inscription, and that's um, the plaster inscription from uh, Kotilet Hajrud. Um, even there, I think all those words are attested in Psalm 68 and in other places. So it seems to be that the lexicon that we have represented here sort of maps onto the words that we have from the biblical, uh, from, from the ancient Hebrew inscriptions as best as we reconstruct. Am I answering your question? Is that what you're well, I'm asking? Well, I'm asking the fact that there must be all these other words out there if they can pull one out. Right. Oh, I see. Right. Uh, that's true. If Lahakat didn't appear in 1 Samuel, we wouldn't know the word. Yeah. Right. So yes, clearly there were many, many other words that we simply uh, don't have, and that's where the inscriptions like the most famously Zida, presumably meaning something like fissure in the rock, uh, in the tunnel inscription, Siloam tunnel inscription. Uh, I think it was Edward Uhlendorf who wrote on this and, and published on this, and I think he pointed out there's no word for cat in the Hebrew Bible. Uh, we don't get the Hebrew word chatul until post-biblical Hebrew, but that doesn't mean they didn't have cats in ancient Israel, right? So. Uh, that's a, a little ditty that I always keep in mind for my students, right? Okay. And that's just a common element in, 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 in societal life. Uh, you know, I don't know to what extent we have found cat bones in the archaeological record, but we certainly know cats from Egypt next door. Yeah. Okay. Um, I have a question. Oh, oh. oh sorry. Go. Go uh, uh, thanks, Gary. Thanks. I was wondering, uh, are there any results of your literary studies that have brought up anything new in the area of um, uh, comparisons to other ancient Near Eastern literature or implications for other more redactional issues like you mentioned to do with uh, the, uh, in one case what you had discovered seemed to undercut the uh, division uh, that was made with Dominic hypothesis, that kind of thing. Are you talking about that in the book or, or did this, these studies bring up anything uh, new otherwise. Right, so I have a chapter called A Challenge to the Documentary Hypothesis where I use examples such as this. Um, and I've written on that earlier, including in my first book, The Redaction of Genesis, and uh, I still stand by what I stated there years ago, although it's now in the second edition. Uh, so, yeah, all these little things like Yami Mahadim, A Few Days, and all the other little connections to me. Uh, the narratives, I mean, my basic statement is there's no doubt that legal cultic P and legal cultic D are separate sources. I mean, that is obviously proven and there's no, 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 no question about that. My only question has to do with the division of the narratives and I prefer to just see what I call N, for lack of a better term, the narrative voice which stretches from Genesis 1 through Deuteronomy 34, a single narrative voice and that doesn't mean that I would say that the genealogy of the Edomites in Genesis 36 is part of that, but a, a single narrative voice which links the stories as they proceed from one uh, to the other, not to be divided up into J, E, and any narrative P portions. Uh, are there occasional discrepancies and contradictions? The answer is, of course, yes, obviously the creation stories, but by and large, that's my, my statement. Now, when you ask about other ancient Near Eastern uh, uh, stories, I would say the following. Uh, there is a much greater, uh, some of what you see here, let, let's just use the, best, the closest body of literature that we have to this, and that would be the Ugaritic uh, poems. Uh, there are large passages which also have repetition in them, where you have Al telling Krait to do something, Karat to do something, Kirta, whatever you want to call them, to do something, and then he does it, right? Little, big, long, command fulfillment sections there as well. And there are very occasional variations, and they are very, very minor ones. So it seems it's much more verbatim repetition, and he told him to do this, and then he did this with changing of the verbs from the command form to the fact that he did it. But the string of words is almost verbatim. I think the biblical writers just took all this to a new height. Right? They took alliteration, repetition with variation, uh, in all of ancient Near all of ancient Egyptian literature. 
I have found one example of a confused syntax. It usually works pretty clear. If you go through the corpus of Middle Egyptian and Late Egyptian narratives, and I actually published on, on that it's a passage in the Shipwrecked Sailor, and it's very interesting where it appears. It appears at the moment that the ship is breaking up. And we all know that that's a chaotic moment, right? A ship breaks up at sea because of a storm, people are drowning, you know, if you were to film that, you can just imagine what a movie director would do with all of that and the water and the cameras and so on. So that's the only place I have ever found in a hieroglyphic text where you have confused language, and of course it fits it perfectly. Uh, the biblical writers just used it to a much greater height. So here and there you can find some of these issues in ancient Near Eastern texts, but not to the same extent of the biblical um, writers. Take one more. I was just going to ask if uh, instances of verbatim repetition in the Hebrew Bible oh. are they uh, distinct because of their dissimilarity to the non-verbatim. Great question, right? When you do find verbatim repetition, what do they tell us? So, if you know the book, I'll get your question first, but just as an aside, if you know the book by George Sabran, Telling and Retelling. He went through the entire corpus of Genesis through Kings, the narrative, the great narrative, and he looked at all examples where there is direct speech and then a repetition of that direct speech. And I think, I don't remember, there are about 100 of those in the, in the grand narrative, and 95 of them have some verbatim repetition, and the ones that don't, so have non-verbatim repetition, and the ones that don't are typically just short phrases. So when Judah sends his friend to go find the Kadesha, no, to find, so not Kadesha, to find the prostitute, um, and he reports back, he uses the same three word phrase. And the people said to him, there is no play, there is no Kadesha, ain't Kadesha, whatever it is, right? Lo haita, lo haita, Kadesha, and then he reports the same words back to Judah, but it's a four word phrase, very simple. So typically you do get, in narration and in quoted speech, non-verbatim repetition. I have found a few places, to get to your question, where you have 15 or 18 words which are verbatim repetition. And um, you find, I found them in the Elijah story, as an example. And yes, you're supposed to see that and pay attention. And my suggestion is wayward Israel versus steady Elijah, right? The one faithful prophet. You also see it in the you know where else you see it actually? And, and, um, uh, and Pharaoh's heart was hardened just as God had said. It's almost always verbatim there because you're supposed, to, you're supposed to see the obstinacy of Pharaoh through the unchanging language because his position never changes either. So yes, thank you for that question. Did you want this? No. Okay, so uh, thank you very much. Very good, thank you. Thank you. Everyone. Thank you.